Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, hi everyone, welcome to Arts Fest Online. This evening's uh, event is a webinar book launch for pen, print and communication in the 18th century. There will be 10 contributors to tonight's webinar. Your host is Dr Malcolm Dick, Director of the Centre for West Midlands History at the University of Birmingham, Co-Director of the Centre for Print and History and Culture and Editor of Midland History. Welcome all, over to you Malcolm. Um, welcome everybody and I'm delighted that you're able to participate in this virtual book launch and I'm very grateful to the University of Wolverhampton for hosting the event. The focus is very much on the book Pen, Print and Communication in the 18th Century, which was jointly edited by Caroline Archer Parry at Birmingham City University and myself. Can we move to the second slide, please? What you have there is the uh, front cover of the book. And those of you who've been involved in, in book publishing, we know how difficult it is very often to decide on a cover that represents what we are focusing upon. And technically, we thought this was a really good image. It's got men and women, in fact, uh, three women. It's got books. It's got what looks like handwritten material. And it's displaying to the world. It looks very much like a bookshop. And what we're doing is, is trying to look at the whole issue of pin pen, print and communication in the 18th century within a wider context. Let's move on. Next slide. The aim of the book I've outlined briefly here. The book takes John Baskerville's self-description as an admirer of the beauty of letters as a starting point to explore the production, distribution, consumption and reception of letters words, texts, and images during the 18th century, or to be more precise, the long 18th century, from roughly 1688 to 1820. It considers how writing, printing, performance, and portrayal contributed to the creation of cultural identity and taste, assisted the spread of knowledge, and contributed to political, economic, social, and cultural change in Britain and the wider world. Next, please. The book was long in being created. It originated from a conference organized by the Baskerville Society at the University of Birmingham in 2015. It contains a selection of the papers which were delivered at the event, plus others which were specially commissioned. Next, please. The context of the book was really a number of considerations about the importance of the 18th century as far as developments in methods of communication were concerned, where interactions were facilitated by a variety of material processes, handwriting, painting, drawing, printing, engraving. It's also a period where there was a continuation and indeed an enhancement of other means of communication, voice, gesture, costume, and performance, for example. Thirdly, there were new and expanding sites for communication, coffee houses, libraries, schools, institutes, theaters, galleries, and shops. Next, please. Fourthly, there were new developments in road and water transport and postal systems to facilitate means of communication, which enabled the products of pen and print to travel further and faster. So in Britain, we've got turnpike trusts, improving roads, we've got the canal system and improvements to rivers. And in very many countries, we've got emerging national postal systems um, for the dissemination of, of, of letters and indeed printed material as well. The final point 
as far as a contextual issue is concerned, is that printing, we can say, increasingly became the means of mass communication. The 18th century, of course, did not invent printing, but it's during that period where we can see it was increasingly being brought within a, a kind of mass society. This involved the production of books, whether we're talking about traditional uh, elements like religious literature, but increasingly scientific texts, novels, and educational texts. Newspapers, of course, which proliferated in the 18th century. Magazines, chapbooks, ephemera, maps, pamphlets, posters, and political literature. We could add and add to that list. So we can certainly say that the 18th century was a truly multimedia society, an experience reflected in the contributions to this book. We are touching the surface here, but we hope that this will enable increasing engagement with the in interconnections between print and communication and writing and letters and voice to make sense of of a really important period. Next, please. Okay, the contributors to this book, um, many of them are busy academics or busy in other respects, and they have given up their time to provide a series of sections, contributions based on their chapters tonight. We are looking at the production in the following ways. Um, we're dividing the day up into four sections or the evening up into four sections. After my introduction, we're gonna have two contributors, then we'll have a set of three, another set of three, and finally a set of two. So although the book contained 14 chapters by scholars, from Britain, Europe, and North America. Um, we are very happy that we've got the majority of them able to contribute, covering a multidisciplinary uh, uh, approach of, uh, of activities, whether we're talking about art and design or digital humanities or drama, history, literature, and language. Each presenter will have five minutes in order to present their argument, their chapter. And we will have questions after each of the sections, not after each contributor. I'm going to ask each contributor as well to introduce themselves um, briefly and then move into their presentation. We'll then move on to the next presenter and then we'll have questions. But I will ask the presenters to limit themselves to five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, all I'll say as far as far as those of you who want to post questions, can you pose them in the question and answer box? I will then read them out for the contributors to answer. So we will move in to our first presenter. Um, Perseda, who is providing her contribution on writing and the preservation of cultural identity, looking at a particular individual in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Perseda, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm. The beauty of letters for the Orthodox Illyrians of the 18th century, actually for the Serbians, Man, the beauty of Cyrillic letters. In the most beautiful and the most precious penmanship manual in Serbian culture is, the, is that of the 18th century polygraph Zahari Orfeli, who was appointed in 1776 by the Illyrian Court Commission to develop guidelines for teaching writing in Serbian and Wallachian elementary schools. The penmanship book entitled Slavenska i Valahiska Calligrafia. Uh, that is to say, Slavic and Wallach calligraphy, appeared in 1778 in Sremski Karolci, today in Serbia, at the time it was uh, southern Hungary. 
Orfelin's work was influenced by source material that he found in the library in St. Carlos. See, and some researchers suggest that the model for Orfelin's 7078 handwriting manual may have been unlikely to change Ivan Hegel and Musta. Instructions for Beautiful Writing Rules and Patterns, published in Vienna in 1775, written by Josef Ignaz von Felbiger, an educational reformer whose methods were far ahead of his uh, time. Uh, my approach was to follow the Penman's track, the image of the Penman and its evolution, which leads to the model to the, uh, of Forfellin and leads Forfellin in turn to be a model for other manuals. Going back both with respect to Orfelin and with respect to his models of so Artifine, uh, now we, can, we are able to define the trace, uh, the model zero, actually the first payment after which the others followed. In the preface to his pedagogical book, Eingeschatten Wissenschaften und Bezeigen Rechtswissenschaften Schulleute, published in 1772, Felbiger directed the reader's attention particularly to a chapter about handwriting. And, um, he referred the, in that same 72, 72 work to the unpublished Calligraphia Silesiaca. Two years later, Calligraphia Silesiaca was published uh, in Glogau, so in 1774, and he actually uh, made a reference to Andras God, uh, Gottlieb Udlitz's Calligraphia Silesiaca. We can see the slide uh, number one. We can see the penman in Calligraphia uh, Silesiaca. So, uh, but it wasn't the first penman actually, because the first penman, we can see the slide number three, is Johann Igat von Felbiga, Eingeschaffen, Wissenschaften und Bezeigen, Rechtschaffen der Schulleute, published in Sagan in 1768. And we can see the first Penman. The difference is, is not small, actually. We can see that uh, Ulrich's Penman is much more uh, sophisticated. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, the slide number three is the first Penman. So the second one is the slide number um, uh, one. And the third one is uh, the slide number two. Uh, unlike to Schumschreiben nach Regel und Muster, it still felt bigger. Uh, and that book was published in Vienna in 1775. So we can see now the slide number four. We can see actually Orfelin's penman, very sophisticated. And we can see the evolution of the slide. And probably the model was both. Felbiger's uh, Penman and both Ulrich's, that is to say the slide number one, because we can see the position of legs, of hands, of his whole body and the table. So we can see evolution in the style. The first Penman, uh, 1768, was produced by Johann Gottfried Krugner, the young, the son of Johann Gottfried Krugner, uh, the older, the homonymous engraver of Leipzig, whose rose to fame for the publication of Johann Sebastian Bach's uh, music sheets. Uh, so particularly, we can see that Orfelin actually uh, could demonstrate a superior level of craftsman craftsmanship and a greater care for details in line engraving. So Orfelin actually exceeded all the expectations. We can go over to questions to the, the panelists or to myself uh, about the book in general. Um, so if you have any questions, please present them in the chat box. Um, if I could start things off, maybe by asking Persida first of all, um, you're obviously very interested in, in these these educational manuals um, and the quality of the images, as you said, are extremely high quality. Um, why do you think they were so important in terms of wider cultural development with, for Serbia and perhaps the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Uh, because uh, for the whole Austrian monarchy, because the 
when Empress made reforms, uh, it meant that reforms should be the same in the in the whole uh, monarchy, provinces uh, included. It's, uh, where in that way you can control the whole monarchy in Martesia. And uh, so the same thing that was uh, meant to be studied in Vienna, for example, it was meant to be the same thing, for example, in the uh, and uh, the, the forest province of the monarchy. So the more uh, <laughs> but in, um, in uh, some provinces you cannot find it, simply that was impossible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Persida, I'll just say that the sound isn't terribly good uh, on your connection. I don't know whether you can do anything about yeah. it. It's it's okay okay okay. It's 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 breaking up, but we'll uh, we'll move move on. But I I got the uh, sense of, of what you were saying. Thank you. Um, thank you, Malcolm. Okay, thank you. Um, how much is known about the consumption or the use and distribution of these manuals? Um, I know this is an issue that uh, we often wrestle with as piece, as print historians. Books exist, but who on earth read them? Um, or use them? Uh, this is a question from Karen Danell. Um, Pasida, could you answer that one? A distribution of manuals. Well, a distribution was meant to be free. Uh, uh, the Empress uh, just wanted to distribute it free. And it was uh, made uh, both by the um, couriers. Right. Um, and during book fairs. Okay, do we know how they were used? Schools? Yeah, do, do, do we have any evidence of how they were used in schools? Do we just know that they were intended for schools? Yeah, yeah, we know that they were intended for schools. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to our second panel with three presenters. And first of all, there's uh, Ruth Larson from Derby University. Ruth, over to you. Um, good evening, um, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak um, tonight. So yes, I'm Ruth Larson and I'm a senior lecturer in history at the University of Derby. Um, when I was doing um, some research many years ago, I came across a letter that Frances Viscountess Erwin wrote to her friend Susan Marchioness Stafford in 1795. She wrote, allow me to appear before you in the only shape I can assume at the distance of 200 miles. And though I am conscious of white sheet is not a proper dress for a drawing room, will you admit me to your private eye and then stuff me in the fire? This letter to somebody, um, or to me as a historian who's also primarily interested in the material culture of the past, was absolutely perfect. It both embodied the importance of letters between aristocratic women, but it also showed about the importance of how those women appeared in those letters. And that's what this um, chapter in the book is really about, is about the performance of the self through the written form of the letter. Now, this is by no means a new topic. It is something that very many historians have tackled and questioned in recent years. But I wanted to take a slightly different um, approach, which was to focus on the form of those um, letters, not necessarily in the handwriting, although I very briefly do mention that, but rather in the physical form that those letters um, took. So I looked at what made the, um, the letters, starting with the, the paper and the ink and the seals, and then started thinking about the life of those letters, taking an object biography approach to the letter. Um, next slide, please. Paper in the 18th century was far more precious and far more expensive than we often think. And part of the reason for the expense of paper in the past was about how it was made. It wasn't made from wood pulp as um, we experienced um, paper in the 19th and 20th centuries, but rather it came in the form of linen rags. And as this extract from the monthly visitor that you can currently see on your screen reflects, it was actually something that needed a great deal of picking by poor women. And so the letters that aristocratic women wrote were created on paper um, and that had been produced by the hard work of those working within linen factories, paper factories, and also those who picked the linen in the first place. 
I'm sure many of the audience tonight have read the evocative work um, Dust, which beautifully shows the problems that um, modern historians fail when reading um, letters and archives in terms of the dust that they produce. But we also see how there was a great deal of dust produ um, produced and the creation of the letters in the first place. Next slide. The paper itself was also extremely expensive. Um, some paper was cheaper um, than others, but some had um, a particular um, cost. And so if you wanted to get um, cheaper um, paper, you could do so, but you could get the most expensive type, which was the thick post hot pressed, which was gilt edged. Um, and this very fine form of, of letter writing was favored by Georgina, the sixth Countess of Carlisle. Next slide. Georgiana, the sixth Countess of Carlisle, um, grew up in um, Chatsmith, and this is where this um, portrait of her is from. But as a married woman, she lived the latter part of her life at Castle Howard. She was a woman who wrote a great deal of letters, primarily to her sister and to her husband, but she had um, recipients of letters not only across um, Great Britain, but also overseas, and particularly in um, North America. She wrote um, letters using paper completely extravagantly. And in the, um, in the chapter that I've written in the book, I've considered how this is a form of conspicuous consumption. Using very thick gilt edged paper was the way in which Georgina could assert her aristocratic status. But it's not just in the writing of these letters that she was doing that, but also in the keeping of it. By using thick paper, by using it in such a way so that when it was opened by the recipient, it didn't tear. Um, she was able to keep these letters for the archives for the future generation. I would argue that most aristocratic women during the 18th and 19th centuries were very concerned about the dynasty of both their natal and their marital families. This dynastic concern did not only take the form of the children that they bore, but also the legacies that they left behind in terms of memories and objects. Those objects are normally focused on the houses and the paintings, but their letters are an important part of the objects that they left behind too. And the form of letters that um, Georgina, Sixth Countess of Carlisle, and a great many of her aristocratic friends produced now form part of the formal archives of these families and are therefore part of their long lasting dynasty. So that's the main argument of my chapter. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. Very good. Thank you indeed. Um, could I move on to our second presenter in the second panel? It's my co editor. Caroline Archer Parry. Um, Caroline, over to you. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, as Malcolm says, I'm co editor on this volume, and I also have the, the pleasure of being able to contribute to it. And I'm also co director, again, along with Malcolm, of the Centre for Printing History and Culture. So, this talk, and indeed my chapter, is about amateur printers in the 18th century. My interest in lay printers stems perhaps from my own status as an amateur. Next slide, please. I've made a whole career out of the typographic arts, first as a typographic designer, then as a lecturer, researcher, writer, and latterly as professor of typography. And yet I have no formal typographic education. I neither went to design school nor served an apprenticeship. Instead, I had the good fortune of being brought up here in Watford in a household which was brimming with printing presses, metal type and a typographic father who taught me how to print. Next slide, please. The printing industry is peppered with amateurs. Indeed, when I was working on my own doctorate on the Kynock Press, a Birmingham-based 20th century printer, I was impressed by just how many of the press managers were amateurs. Donald Hope had a background of manufacturing metal windows in Birmingham. Herbert Simon was from a family of Manchester cloth manufacturers. And Michael Clapham was a failed Cambridge Classics scholar. None had formal typographic education and none served an apprenticeship. Next slide, please. My current typographic interest is John Baskerville who's perhaps the most famous, influential, and historically important of all English printers of the 18th century. Known as the complete printer, 
Baskerville considered all aspects of the craft and did more than anyone to enhance printing and publishing industries of his day. And yet he was an amateur who, by his own admission, was trained to no profession. How Baskerville became interested in printing is open to speculation, but he was certainly not alone. Amateur interest in printing started early in the 18th century when fashionable people, royalty, gentry, men of letters, first took up printing as a hobby. That anyone with the interest and the financial wherewithal had the freedom to engage with the craft so early in the century may seem surprising. It was, after all, only a few short years since state control over printing was lifted in England in 1695. State control not only regulated the number of presses and printers, but also determined what could and could not be produced. And the master printers themselves also imposed strict regulations around apprenticeships, which further closed the professions to outsiders. Next slide, please. However, despite all the restrictions, non-indentured individuals, including monarchs, middling sorts, and the man in the street, began to infiltrate the craft and to print for pleasure and sometimes for profit. In doing so, they blurred the demarcation between the professional and the layman, and in some instances, such as Baskerville, challenged the master printer at his own game. My chapter, therefore, considers how printing, one of the most highly skilled, closely policed, and most threatening of all the trades, became, during the 18th century, a craft widely pursued by amateurs. It considers the changing complexion of the lay printer, how they might have acquired their typographic skills and sourced the necessary equipment. The chapter also reflects on what they produced, their motivations for doing so, and the intellectual and technological environment that enabled the emergence of the amateur printer at the time. So why did do-it-yourself printing become so popular during the 18th century? I think this was partly because printing at home was a classless and egalitarian pastime. It could be undertaken by the young and the old and by men and women alike in stark contrast to the trade printing, which was riddled with structures and traditions and less than permissive to women. Printing for pleasure gave liberty to the amateur to engage with a closed craft and express themselves in a new era of comparative press freedom. This liberty gave the amateur printer autonomy over their own words because their texts were, unmedi were unmediated either by printer, publisher or state. There was a sense that by rendering their compositions into print, their thoughts were somehow protected from the ravishing of time and preserved for posterity in a way not possible with the pen. While the pen may have been cheaper, more available and easier to use, print endowed words with an important additional dimension, immortality, or at least longevity, which in turn gave affirmation and legitimacy to the authors. Printing, by virtue of multiplication, produced items more public than their written counterparts. Print was seen as indelible, while the products of the pen were ephemeral. Printing also had wide appeal because it straddled both the arts and the sciences and allowed the public to engage with a new and fashionable technology, whether for recreation, vanity, education or practical purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline, for that uh, um, distinctive contribution. I'd like to move on to our third presenter in this section. That's Dr. Joanna Jarvis. Uh, uh, Joanna has recently been awarded her PhD, so I'm sure you'd all like to congratulate her. Over to you, Joanna. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, I have a background in theatre and performance. And I'm particularly interested in women in the public eye and how they are rep were represented. So the original conference offered me the opportunity to look more closely at the changing relationship between female performers and the press. Uh, first slide, please. In the autumn of 1782, two actresses, Sarah Siddons and Mary Robinson, arrived in London for the beginning of the social season. 
as women in the public eye, they both received a lot of attention from the press. This chapter discusses the growing sophistication of the writing in these publications and the different methods used by each woman to try and take control and counter any negative impressions. For by the middle of the 18th century, the growing number of newspapers and periodicals was feeding an increasing appetite for news and comment with a particular interest in the lives of public figures. Newspaper reports moved from being purely descriptive to demonstrating a moral ambivalence towards women in the public eye. Next slide, please. For Mrs. Siddons, 1782 was the beginning of the most prestigious and glittering period of her career, which would see her become a very popular and successful actress. This reputation sat alongside doubts as to the propriety of a woman whose rightful role was as a wife and mother being paid to parade herself on the public stage. Audiences flocked to her performances, allowing her to command higher fees. And this brought comment in the press with some wild estimates as to what she was being paid and narratives cleverly constructed to set her alongside prostitutes also paid for their work. She countered these influence inferences by emphasizing her domestic role as a mother. Her talent was employed solely as a way of providing for her family. Alongside the text, visual representations were also becoming an increasingly popular factor in the public perception of these women and as you can see on this slide, Mrs. Siddons used the growing popularity of cheap prints as a way of cementing her image as a powerful actress, using them to provide a positive image for her public. Next slide, please. For Mrs. Robinson, imagery began to focus on the more negative aspects of her life. She arrived in London from Paris, where she had fled after the end of her affair with the Prince of Wales, later to be George IV. Anxious to retrieve her reputation, she set about presenting herself on the stage of London society. Periodicals such as the Gossipy Town and Country magazine had realised the potential of pictures to sell copy and began to use illustrations for their tete-a-tete column which highlighted a couple commanding, uh, uh, conducting an illicit affair. As seen here, oval prints conjured up ideas of family portraits in the home with titles hinting at the protagonists. The accompanying text gave biographical details and speculated on the longevity of the relationship. Next slide, please. The growing popularity of prints also fed an appetite for satire, and Mrs. Robinson soon became collateral damage to the murderous reputation of her new partner, Colonel Tarleton, becoming the subject of several prints aimed at him. This is a particularly vicious image depicting her with Tarleton and the Prince of Wales, with Mrs. Robinson shown as a military prostitute suspended over the door. Any sense of deference owed to the royal family and the country's rulers is disappearing in these satires. Last slide, please. Mrs. Robinson never quite managed to regain the public support that she had received as an actress on the stage, and she retired from public life and became a poet. Mrs. Siddons went on to become the greatest actress of her day and did much to establish acting as a morally suitable profession for women. The press attention that they received was becoming increasingly intrusive and they responded in kind by attempting to counter the impression being given. An interesting and new, new dynamic in this relationship. Each woman, excuse me, each woman demonstrated great personal agency in their attempts to build a professional life for themselves and an unusual achievement for a woman at that time. In many ways, the methods employed by the newspapers can be seen as the beginning of an attitude to the reporting of women and their lives, 
which is still prevalent today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Joanna. And uh, we have time to um, ask any questions that people will want to pose to the to the three uh, presenters. Um, so if I can start things off uh, and, uh, until we receive some on the question and answer box. Okay, one, some have come through. Okay, first question from Holly Day to Caroline. Um, Caroline, could you tell us a bit more about the cost of such home printing presses and whether many examples survive? Um, it depends what period we're looking at. Um, in the early 18th century, you, you would have had to have been immensely wealthy to uh, purchase a printing press because you were purchasing full scale printing works along with assistance to run. Uh, the said presses. As we move through the century, uh, around, 18, uh, around 1765, we get the first miniature presses being manufactured specifically for use in the home, which would have been considerably cheaper. Um, I'm afraid I don't have prices for these presses that uh, I can offer you, but again, it depends on the, the scale and the size of the works that people were requiring. Um, just as an addendum, um, Caroline, I, I think on the image that you showed of an amateur um, amateur printer, the the image on the table looked very much like uh, one of James Watt's copying machines rather than a printing press. Now, I may be wrong. I, I, I didn't have a lot of time to look at that, but um, um, but clearly um, the, the, the the woman who's sitting uh, on on the right of the image is looks as if she's she's sorting out uh, fonts or something like that. So I may be wrong. It's a very interesting diagram, I thought. Yeah, well, I mean, it was very much sold to the public as a family affair. So right. mother and father could write their letters, and a, a a daughter could then set the letters in type, um, print, and another member of the family would proofread it and then hang them up to dry. So the, these things were really manufactured so you could work them off your, your dining room table. So they're very, very small scale, um, much like an Adana printing press today, basically. Um, many people start off their printing careers or their first brushes with letterpress with little Adanas that they can work from their kitchen tables. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, OK, question for, for Ruth. This is from L. Peters. I, I take it paper would have been expensive for the sixth countess. What's your best guess on how much buying paper for her to write letters would have cost? Um, so I don't know for the sixth countess um, herself. We don't have um, those types of bills left at Castle Howard. But I know that Frances Erwin, whose letter writing paper was by no means to, um, by any means as nice she was spending about 50 pounds a year just on the paper um, and that does include the the ink and the seals and um, thankfully for both um francis and viscountess erin and the sixth countess of carlisle they were both able to use franks and um, through the parliamentary system so they both didn't have have to pay um, for post or posts that they received and um, of course it was the recipients who who paid for posts but they managed to wangle their way into the free postage system so they did save money somewhere okay th thank thank you um, very much uh ruth there's uh, another question from uh, maureen bell who's uh, first of all thanking all the panelists for a really interesting panel the question is, both Ruth and Caroline mentioned longevity. Ruth, were letters retrieved by the writers from recipients with this in mind? Or did they keep copies? Um, so the letters at Castle Howard were returned later. Um, so not by, um, not during the generation, um, but following death. So there seems to have been a great deal of familial sorting out and returning letters back. And that seemed to have been a bit of a custom amongst Whig aristocrats. That's one of the topics that needs a lot more work, but there's somebody at um, Chatsworth doing a project on archiving and women in the 19th century. So we might find more answers out about that in the, in the near future. Thank you very much. And then Maureen's question for Caroline. Um, what sort of things did do-it-yourself printers produce? Were they more often ephemeral than intended for long survival? 
Um, again, it depends who the producer was. Um, Horace Walpole, for example, at his Strawberry Hill Press in, in London, he was an amateur printer, but he printed uh, works of his friend Thomas Gray, the poet. Um, I don't think those were intended to be ephemeral. Other end of the spectrum, um, uh, in, in Litchfield, the apothecary there would be printing labels for his um, boxes of medicines and chemi chemicals. People at home often, you know, families at home, presumably the work that they produced was a bit more ephemeral. It would be their own stories and poems that they produced either for family consumption or distribution to their friends. So the sort of material that produ was produced was extremely various. Um, and therefore, it, some were, had longevity, some had a much shorter shelf life. Um, thank you, Caroline. Um, there's a, another question for Ruth from Katie Crowther. Um, I wondered if you could say a bit more about privacy and how this worked alongside letters as conspicuous materials. Um, yes, yeah, so well, this is interesting because um, there are quite a lot of um, letters which have uh, on them stuff me in the fire and uh, and and burn me um, so there is this sort of sense of, of private letters and also in some of the envelopes actually the folds of the envelopes they're writing um, secret messages and also in the paper um, itself and um, there's sometimes little bits which says when reading is allowed don't read off this next bit so all of those are there showing a certain degree of privacy within um, the, the, the letters but also at the same time, they are public um, documents. You couldn't really expect them um, not to be read. They're often on show and people would even read them in public even if there are private elements to it. What's notable about Georgina Carlyle is that she's using this really expensive paper, even to short notes to her husband at the other side of the house, Castle Howard's fairly huge. And so she's using this sort of display um, all, all the time in that ream of, of paper um, all, all the time. So it works in different sort of ways, but generally, even when they're private, the letters are quite conspicuous. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I have a question for Joanna. Um, Joanna, what I found very, very interesting is how uh, the, 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 the two actresses you were exploring were steering their way um, as women through a male-dominated society where they were seen at one respect as the uh, lowest of the low and how they were manipulating print images and print material in order to enhance their reputation. Um, were any other women doing anything similar, do you think? I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I, I'm knowledgeable enough about that. I think one of the things that maybe this act, the actresses were able to do that that other women couldn't was that they would have had a a group of supporters who um, they would do what were called puffs. So a, a newspaper would run um, a paragraph about how wonderful Mrs. Siddons was in in doing this, that, or the other, um, and. It, it wasn't really an opinion, it was friends of Mrs. Siddons puffing her and the same for Mrs. Robinson. And I think maybe they were in a position to command that sort of uh, support in a way that other um, women were not. I think the tete-a-tete -tete was a huge problem. If you were an aristocratic woman and you appeared in one of those um, columns, it, it could be absolutely disastrous. Um, as a man, it could perhaps be a badge of, of honour that you were, you know, appearing with somebody, but not so for the woman. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Joanna, and thank, thanks to all three of you for your contributions and uh, your answers to the questions. Could we move on to panel three now? And... Our first presenter is Kelly Wilkinson from the University of Warwick. Uh, Kelly, over to you. Uh, great, thank you so much, uh, Malcolm and Caroline. So my contribution to the volume centered on a tranche of classified correspondence that was leaked to the Calcutta Press in 1826 and the government investigation that followed suit. Uh, 
So I discovered the leak in a form of a series of preserved pamphlets um, while working in the archives on a completely different topic, actually. So I was finishing my PhD, and my focus was on the East India Company's political representatives at Indian royal courts. And in trying to dig up information about these men, I discovered that one of the most celebrated of the group was the subject of a previously forgotten controversy. So can we have the next slide, please? So the man in question was Sir David Octoloni, Knight Commander of the Bath. And for contemporaries, Octoloni was predominantly famous for his military pursuits, particularly his successful defense of Delhi against the Marathas in 1804 and his victories in the Nepal War of 1814 to 1816. Uh, next slide, please. The Octoloni column in, in Calcutta, now the Shaheed Minar or Martyrs Monument, was erected in 1828 in his memory and attests to his reputation at the time. Next slide, please. In recent scholarship, Octoloni is mostly remembered as a so-called white Mughal an East India Company man who cohabited with Indian women and assimilated into Indian elite society, uh, as you can see in this portrait here. Yet what's often forgotten about Octoloni is that shortly after his death, he was the subject in, of immense debate in Calcutta because of the publication of his classified correspondence with government on the subject of a military coup in the allied Indian state of Bharatpur. When this correspondence appeared in a Calcutta newspaper, the Governor General and Council of the East India Company set up an investigation to identify the source of the leak. The investigation was ultimately unsuccessful, and yet, I argue, its findings, and indeed its untimely end, can actually tell us a lot about how information circulated or failed to circulate as it happened in colonial society. So first, part of the reason why the investigation was never able to pin down a single source was because closer inquiry revealed that actually this classified correspondence had been circulating in multiple printed and manuscript forms. The close social, professional, and familial connections which bound people together in India meant that even supposedly secret information was sometimes widely disseminated, a process which was greatly facilitated by the availability of scribal labor on the one hand and commercial printing presses on the other. So the ease with which information could be copied out or privately printed and then disseminated is for me part of the explanation for why around this time, the East India Company became increasingly disillusioned about the value of trying to censor the newspaper press in India during this period. Next slide, please. At the same time, the insurmountable obstacle which finally ended the investigation for good was the unwillingness of one of Octoloni's correspondents to reveal who he had shared the documents with. So eventually the government investigation traced uh, the paper's chain of custody to one of Octoloni Octoloni's close friends and colleagues, Charles Theophilus Metcalf, who you can see pictured here. And according to Charles Metcalf, the gentleman to whom he had transmitted copies of the correspondence wished to keep their identity secret. And given that the exchange was a private transaction, to quote Metcalf, he felt compelled to honor their request. Even more surprising, perhaps, is that the officials conducting the investigation on behalf of the government actually accepted Metcalf's insistence on his privacy and did not even attempt to pressure him for further information, even though it was pretty clear that these anonymous correspondents were the source of the unauthorized disclosure. So for me then, this case study is an interesting example of the unevenness of the relationship between public and private in 19th century colonial society. Uh, at a time where state secrets sometimes meant very little, but gentlemanliness seemed to mean everything. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, thank you very much in, in, indeed. Um, 
I'd like to move on to our second presenter, the first of two um, research students. Um, um, Elaine Mitchell, first of all, over to you. Thank you, Malcolm. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I learned recently from a seminar with Draw Warman that uh, what the heck is a valid research question? And that was rather my reaction when I saw the object of my chapter. Plants, print and nurserymen don't perhaps naturally spring to mind in the context of 18th century Birmingham, uh, a town more usually framed within the history of manufacturing than within the history of marigolds. But John Brunton's catalogue of plants draws attention to the connections to be made between garden history and printing history and culture and illuminates new aspects of Birmingham's history in the 18th century. Could I have the next slide, please? This is the catalogue. Uh, it was published in Birmingham in 1777. It was printed by Robert Martin, who'd been a former assistant to John Baskerville. Uh, Baskerville, of course, the typographer, printer, and indeed grower of marigolds. Martin used Baskerville's types to print the catalogue, so it comes with something of a pedigree. This little book sits within the context of a century that saw a flood of plant introductions into Britain from around the world. Introductions that were the result of exploration, colonisation and commercialisation. Plants were a commodity that increased in supply and after Joseph Banks' return from Australia, gardens could be stocked with plants taken from all five continents. In the English provinces, the commercial nursery business expanded, uh, run by women as well as men, and head gardeners like John Brunton moved from employment on the country estate to establish businesses in urban centres. If I could have the next slide, please. At the same time, the growth of print disseminated horticultural and botanical knowledge to an audience with an appetite for landscape improvement and the latest plant novelties. Nurserymen like John Brunton adopted prints, such as his trade card here, not only to sell plants, but also to position themselves within enlightenment culture and practice. Through Brunton's plant catalogue, the chapter also explores the role of nurserymen in shaping the British landscape. The thousand plants listed in the catalogue reveal not only species on offer to Midlands gardeners, but how the British landscape, and indeed our own gardens, have been transformed by plant introductions from around the world. It demonstrates what Alan Buell has described as a novel nature, that is one composed of plants that came from elsewhere entirely. Next slide, please. Many of the ingredients of this novel nature flowed into Britain from colonization. North American species, such as the tulip tree from Virginia and the laurel magnolia from South Carolina were brought to colonize in their turn, the gardens of the British gentry. But it's not only the plants listed that move the catalog beyond its site of production in the English Midlands. Plants such as Crown Imperial, Mock Orange, Cedar of Lebanon and Tulip demonstrate the influence of the Near and Middle East on British gardens. And if I could have the next slide, please. And the deployment of Fleuron or printer's flowers on the half title can be traced back to Islamic designs. These are the stylized flower motifs here across the top and bottom of the page. The catalog can be seen as a shopping list for the horticulturally acquisitive, but, the, but in the process of writing this chapter, it led me to explore it as a material object as well, produced by collecting, consuming, and transforming the resources of nature. Both through the means and the materials of its production, it's a product of the vegetable world and demonstrates that the growth in the production and consumption of print was consequent upon nature being consumed in the process. My final slide, please. This modest publication hides its social and cultural significance, 
Gardeners in and around Birmingham were as connected to the natural worlds of Asia, the Americas and Africa as they were to the neighbouring worlds in Warwickshire, Worcestershire or Staffordshire. And whilst the focus of Birmingham's history has been on entrepreneurs who took the products of nature and turned them into the products of the Industrial Revolution, John Brunton illustrates another type of entrepreneur overlooked in Birmingham's historiography one who took the products of nature and used them to underpin what Keith Thomas has described as the gardening revolution of the 18th century. Enabled by Birmingham's growing printing industry, plants, print and commerce combined to advance the spread of botanical knowledge and plant material. My final thought is that long after the catalogues themselves disappeared, the plants purchased continued to change the face of the British landscape. Back to you, Malcolm. Extremely elegant presentation. Um, let us move on to our final presentation in this section. Uh, Jenny Dixon, uh, and another of our research students at the university. Um, Jenny, over to you. Hello. Um, so if I could just have my first slide, please. So just to give some of the geographical context, um, this is Bissett's Modern Museum, which was his shop and his cabinet of curiosities in Birmingham. And James Bissett is someone who's been of interest since I found his magnificent directory, the name itself bring, bring, bringing intrigue. It was at its core a trade directory listing Birmingham's many manufacturers, but Bissett always intended it for it to be more than that. Uh, it was printed in 1800 and stands out from others of the period as it was in illustrated with 27 elaborate copper plate prints. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these included images of Birmingham's prominent manufacturers, as well as ornate lists of businesses, such as this plate, which uh, was designed to look like business cards strewn out. Um, so it was an elaborate piece of printed promotion. Bissett produced a variety of promotional material. Uh, next slide, please. Um, some was for his own business interests, such as his trade card, um, which pushed, de pushed design conventions of the period. Uh, it imitated the design of a banknote and would have stood out from other trade cards of the time, being quite a playful um, and surprising design. Um, but Bissett also promoted Birmingham itself, uh, reflecting an admiration for the town in which he worked. Uh, he produced a coin listing the curiosities of Birmingham and the magnificent directory which he produced was part of this. Uh, Bissett understood consumer curiosity of the period, realizing that for visitors to the town, this was probably their first glimpse inside the many manufacturers, uh, which used intriguing technical and mechanical processes to make an abundance of goods. Next slide. Bissett's directory almost certainly contained the first printed de depictions of the interiors of manufacturers in Birmingham. To emphasize the idea that these were being exposed to view, um, this scene uh, was framed with curtains pulled back, which reflects something of the visitor, visitor experience. Uh, 18th century directories were tools for traders and businesses, but with a public interest in visiting manufacturers, they also acted as guidebooks, pinpointing the major ones to be visited. Bissett's magnificent directory went beyond this and used print not only to visually represent Birmingham, but also to reflect the experience of visiting the town. He achieved this in two main ways. Firstly, this was a high quality production. Bissett used the best engravers and printer in Birmingham. The engravers included Francis Eggington and Peter Rothwell, and the printer was Miles Swinney, who was described at the time as the only typefinder outside of London. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the plate depicting Swinney's uh, printing works and casting shop, which was labeled to show which building was which. The usefulness of trade directories was about two or three years as businesses came and went. Bissett though stated that his directory would, and I quote, from the novelty of the design and the eccentricity of such a concatenation, find a place in the cabinets of the cog cognoscenti or the libraries of the literati. 
This was not simply a trade directory or even a guide, but a publication to keep as encapsulating the Birmingham of the period. And quality not only influences perception, but also encourages publications to be kept. The other way Bissett reflected an experience of visiting Birmingham was in the overall design. The directory was preceded by several poems. Uh, one took the reader on a tour of Birmingham through the eyes of the classical gods. And this conveyed not only what to see, but how to see it. The experience was one of wonder as the gods themselves stood amazed when they saw the manufactories. Next slide. The copper plate images too were visual depictions of Birmingham merging reality and fantasy. This plate advertising Henry Clay's Japan works combined a ruined classical scene with a highly modern canal lock forming a juxtaposition between mythology and Birmingham innovation. This was a Birmingham imagined as well as a guide to the actual town. Bissett's directory represents something of the contemporary experience of visiting Birmingham in 1800. Diaries and letters of those who visited are also useful in outlining this, but the magnificent highlights some of the unspoken experience of wonder and delight in seeing something for the first time. Thank you. Any, those are three uh, fascinating presentations um, covering very different themes. Um, can we move into the questions first of all? There's a couple of questions for Elaine. Uh, first of all from John Hinks. Um, Elaine, do you know whether Martin had acquired Baskerville's type or did he borrow it or even print it on Baskerville's premises? Um, Martin had acquired Baskerville's types after his death. Um, I don't know how long he had them for. Um, Caroline, of course, <laughs> would be the expert on this. Um, uh, the address on the uh, title page is 10 Mount Pleasant, and I believe those were Martin's premises. So I think we can be fairly certain that they were printed there. Um, there are a couple of other um, Brunton catalogues, later catalogues. Uh, these are not printed by Martin, um, and I'm afraid it slipped my mind as to who has printed them. But yes, I believe that Martin had Baskerville's types for a while after Baskerville's death. Thank you very much, Elaine. There's a second question for you from, from Susan Wyman. Hello, Susan. Um, um, uh, Susan says a fascinating discussion on how someone who previously worked on an estate and then set up as an entrepreneurial businessman. Do trade directors show that there were other such tradesmen and what do we know about their backgrounds and businesses? What sources did you use? Trade directories. Hello, Susan. It, it's lovely to see you, even if I'm not seeing you. Um, trade directories do show that there were other such trademen, tradesmen. Um, how they are termed varies widely. Um, they could be termed gardeners, they could be termed nurserymen, they could be termed seedsmen. So um, I guess as is usual with, with uh, most trades, there's a variety of terms and it's always difficult to pin down who is who and what they're doing. Um, from work that's been done on other catalogues that are similar to Brunton's, and there aren't very many of them, because there wouldn't have been a lot of nurserymen who would have gone to the trouble of having those sorts of catalogues printed. Um, but through the work of Richard Coulton and Sarah Easterby Smith, um, their background was often as a head gardener on a private estate because they would have um, really known their trade extremely well. Uh, through that sort of background. And something I haven't investigated, um, and it's a, a bit of a side issue, is that um, a lot of these um, gardeners uh, 
came from Scotland, and I'm not quite sure what that should be. Um, in terms of Brunton's business, I don't know how others set up their business, but I do know that he was lent £100 by Earl Gore. Uh, he'd worked or, uh, on Earl Gore's Trentham estate in Staffordshire. And there are records that show he was lent this money and um, there are sad letters, he's not been able to pay it all back. So we have an example there, I guess, of Gore acting as a patron. Um, Brunton ended rather sadly, he broke his leg. He had to write um, a letter to Gore's steward looking for, uh, saying he'd, he'd really got nothing apart from an annuity to offer. Might he have a little cottage on the estate amongst the trees that he knew so well that he'd planted. Um, so, well, business these days, of course, is very, uh, can be tenuous. And indeed it was there. So I can only give you the example of what I know about Brunton's background. The sources I used were varied because there is no archive. So I've used trade directories. I've used uh, bills from other estates to get a view for Brunton's customers. He supplied Matthew Bolton, for example. Um, I will, I've used some a few papers in the Trentham collection up in Staffordshire, um, and uh, but you know my my main source I guess has has that's led me in down a lot of different roads has been the catalogue of plants. So, but I I've, I've tried to find sources um, where I can. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, presenters a couple of questions of, of, of my own, but please keep feeding questions in. Um, um, Callie, a fascinating presentation, particularly about the in, in engagement or the connection between, uh, put it crudely, a white uh, colonialist and uh, Indian culture. Are there many any other examples of individuals um, sort of straddling various boundaries that, that throw light on the, the culture of the time, particularly through either their letter writing or their use of print media? Um, so you mean like maybe are there other people like Octoloni who might yes, yes. leak documents? So yeah, yeah, it's um, so it's in in the course of my PhD, I came across a few a few people like this, and it's it's actually the topic of my of my current research is looking at some of these whistleblowers. Um, many of them come from within the military, interestingly. Um, so. Ocrelloni is quite unusual in that he put his name to what he was disclosing. And that's largely because he was close to death. So this was kind of like a deathbed confession, which meant that he felt fully comfortable with putting his name to it. For the most part, um, many of them are just anonymous submissions to newspapers. And so we know very little about the people who are actually um, producing uh, these disclosures. Apart from there are a few cases where the East India Company was able to successfully identify them. Uh, and contrary to their expectations, they had anticipated that many of these whistleblowers would be sort of discontented subalterns and, and kind of lower members of the military. But in fact, many of them were actually really senior officers with kind of celebrated military careers, much like Octoloni. So it's a recurring source of embarrassment for them at this moment that in fact, they can't say, well, it's just because, you know, in, in the same way that people might today, a whistleblower um, might be delegitimized by saying that they're disaffected or discontented or disappointed in their career. And in fact, what's embarrassing for the East India Company is that some of their sort of more prominent military heroes, uh, including some like Octoloni who um, have these sort of medals and knighthoods are actually speaking out against them and what they're doing. So there's certainly a, a pattern of this kind of thing happening. That's great. Thank you very much. And um, a, a question for for Jenny. Um, we probably touched on this before, Jenny, but um, uh, Bissett's directory is a wonderfully rich 
and varied uh, piece of printing and uh, was obviously a very expensive piece of printing to produce given the, the number and quality of images. Are you aware of anything similar happening elsewhere, either in the United Kingdom or indeed anywhere else at the time? No, I, I did look and see if there was anything similar happening or even if Bissett's directory seemed to influence anyone, anyone else. Um, the trade card that I showed was copied, um, but I think probably the expense prohibited anybody from producing anything similar. I, I don't think he made a fortune out of it. Um, I, I don't think he made major losses, but it wasn't a, a huge money making scheme. And then he tried afterwards to produce a national directory, which was to encompass all the manufacturing towns, uh, which he realized was he was going to lose a lot of money on and then reprinted the Birmingham direct directory with a, a miscellany of, of other plates that he produced just to try and recoup some of the losses that he made. So I think probably cost, uh, it, it wasn't cost effective to produce these kind of directories. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, we're moving on to our final session with um, two presenters. Um, uh, first one is Emil, uh, Emil uh, Rizbak. Um, and the second one, John Melton. Uh, Emil, could you uh, proceed with with uh, your presentation, please? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, so uh, my chapter, Perceptions of England, explores the printing and reissue of English plays in Germany and the Low Countries across the 18th century. Although the reception of English drama and especially Shakespeare in translation in these regions has long been acknowledged, a widespread interest in original language English writing and the availability of this on the continent is less well known. The chapter suggests that the political and trade relationships between Britain and Europe and the growth of English as an international language might have had some bearing on this market for English literature. So my story begins with the Scotsman Thomas Johnson, who printed more than 100 editions of English plays at The Hague between 1710 in 1731. Although carrying a variety of imprints, the three plays shown on this slide were all printed by Johnson and also available in extensive collections under his general title pages. Next slide, please. Copies of these collections survive across Britain and Europe, and Johnson's correspondence makes it clear that both of these markets supplied important outlets for Johnson's business. When he died in 1735 and his remaining stock was sold on by his heirs, many of his leftover plays were purchased by Hendrik Schurler the Elder, also of The Hague and a former associate of Johnson's. These were then passed to his son, Schurler Jr., who reissued them under new volume titles as a select collection of the best modern English plays. Next slide. Schurler must have seen a ready market for these works investing time and effort in expanding Johnson's collection. He collaborated with Robert Dodsley of London on William Whitehead's very popular play, The Roman Father, which was printed, as can be seen, with a special monogram device that seems to have been copied from Johnson's plays. Shirley also printed several new Congreve texts to supplement those left over from Johnson and to create a works of this author. Unlike his select collection, advertised as printed at The Hague, this works masqueraded as a London produced edition by Jacob Tonson. To trade on Tonson's name in this way implies that his productions were already familiar to Dutch readers when Shirley produced this edition. Shirley further advertised and sold the Londoner James Brindle as the British stage, which was yet another dramatic collection bringing together remainder to Johnson texts. Next slide, please. Both Shirley's select collection and Brindle's The British Stage were later advertised for sale by Gottlob Richter of Altenburg, who marketed his own collection, here shown on the left, as well as Shirley and Brindley's. One final anonymous series of title pages are also found associated with Johnson plays, and these were printed and reprinted between 1761 and 1781, 70 years after the plays they preface were first published by Johnson. Although there are clearly competing interpretations of all this, that several publishers thought English plays were a readily saleable proposition in Europe, but also that Johnson's plays were seemingly impossible to get rid of for these publishers, 
the entirely new collection that was eventually issued by Richter on the right here and the survival of copies of this across Central and Eastern Europe suggests considerable familiarity with English culture amongst Richter's customers. The plays he printed in this collection were contemporary hits of the London stage, some of them appearing just that year, rather than classics in the way that Johnson and Shirley's editions of Shakespeare or Congreve were. Final slide, please. We might lastly point out just how well used many of these plays seem to have been. Examples with manuscript glosses, most frequently in French, reveals the language interest they must have carried. The pages depicted on this slide form the prefatory matter to a collection of Shakespeare Johnson plays, now at the Trezoir archives in Friesland. Unlike the purchases of Richter's new plays, the owner of this volume was clearly interested in canonical English literature. Since the establishment of a literary canon was so tied up with some aspects of English identity in the 18th century, the possibility that international engagements with her drama were also inflected by such concerns certainly warrants further investigation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil. That's, uh, that's uh, wonderful. Thank you. And uh, we can move on to our sort of final presenter uh, of today, uh, John Melton. Uh, John, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, <clears throat> In the Sir John Soane Museum Library in London, there is a book by Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Titled Opera de Piranesi, it is Soane's rebound first edition copy of volume one of Piranesi's infamous Le Antichita Romane from 1756. It is an extremely well-thumbed book that is fox stained throughout, but one engraved page illustration in particular has been studied much more intensively than any other. The page is in fact worn thin by countless hands. It is heavily stained and even cracked at the margin where one naturally holds the page leaf. Next slide, please. The copper plate is number 41, a plan of Nero's Nymphium, and is one of the final full page engravings at the back of the book. Research indicates that it was most likely completed and included just prior to the book's release in 1756. The similarities of Nero's Nymphium to the RA scholarship design produced by John Soane on his grand tour of Italy strikes you immediately. Next slide, please. Both are plans of grandiose Roman structures. Both have two dominant title blocks rendered as antique stone fragments, and both use inscriptions of serifless letter forms. Soane's design for a parliament building for Britain was in response to his brief set by the tutors at the RA and he duly exhibited the work in the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition of 1779. And it is Soane's design for a British Senate House that was previously recognised as the earliest known example of a deliberate near geometric serifless letter form that leads directly to the first sans serif metal typefaces of the 19th century. Although Soane did not produce this drawing himself, it was drawn up uh, based upon his sketches by an Italian draftsman, he clearly appreciated the importance of including serifless lettering and the reference to Piranesi's plan for a bath complex for Nero. Next slide, please. But why was Soane so clearly fascinated with Piranesi's Onian Niana letter forms? And what was Piranesi conveying within these distinctive stone letter blocks? Next slide, please. Well, Piranesi is attempting to strengthen his argument for the origin of the serifless letter being that of the Etruscans. From Italian soil and not emanating from Greece, the Italian Romanists were under threat from the Hellenists for the true origins of classical architecture. Here, Piranesi's E, with deliberately applied component serifs, is demonstrating that the Latin alphabet evolved out of the Etruscan and via the archaic Latin through into the inscriptional majuscule of the Roman letter. Next slide, please. This argument is known as the Greco Roman debate for the origins of architecture. 
and the Hellenists challenged an accepted authority of Rome, which was secured since the Renaissance. Within this context, all early unearthed antiquities found on Italian soil in the 18th century were considered Etruscan in principle, even if they appeared to be Greek. And importantly, the serifless inscriptional letters they contained were considered the primitivist primal forms and the foundation of civilized language. Next slide, please. By the 1780s, a young son confidently ignores what has become a tired debate of the 1750s and 60s and adopts the serifless letter as the purest inscriptional form for his own Sonian neoclassical architecture. When his practice is, is established in 1784, he sets about promoting the use of sans serif typo typography within many of his drawings. Little remains in situ today of his proposed serifless inscriptional letter forms. The letters of 1785 to 6 on the Evelyn Monument at Leamington are now obliterated by the weather whilst those of the Cambridge Museum from 1791 were never ever built. Next slide, please. Those on the Norwich Castle Jail extension from 1789 were likely inscribed in serifless letters above the entrances, but the building was demolished in the mid 19th century. Next slide, please. The Norwich Jail was designed around the same time as the Langley Lodges, also in Norfolk, for Sir Thomas Beauchamp Proctor, with the final design above dated 1790. Next slide, please. And they remain still in existence today. They are very much in the Sonian style of serifless letter forms, with a wide T based upon a square, a near full circle O, an equilateral V and bullets between the words. Next slide, please. So through the work of Soane and his contemporaries in the arts, such as John Flaxman, the use of this stark block letter continued. Up until the influx of the Egyptian artifacts in 1805 and the Egyptomania of the early 19th century, this generates the need for the commercially availability of a metal typeface to represent the antique. Final slide, please. And by 1816, William Caslon IV creates two lines English Egyptian and the sans serif with its obvious visual strengths comes to predominance through the 19th century in representing the modern and ultimately the commercial driven world of the 20th century. Thank you. Um, uh, let me ask people to submit questions if they wish, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll begin the process. Uh, a question for Emil. Um, Emil, you were looking at perceptions of England, you, uh, uh, English theatrical uh, publications in Germany and Netherlands, and mm. uh, the Netherlands. Do you, are you aware of anything happening in reverse? Um, in that you mean what's being published of those countries? Yes, here. In, in England or indeed of other countries uh, publishing uh, work in England. Um, to my, I actually, I know nothing about that. It's something I would love to find out about. Um, the talk I've given it, um, it comes out of working on Thomas Johnson. Sure. Um, so it's very much my expertise is on the Dutch area, the Dutch public. Yeah. English yeah. writing. Um, but no, it's something I'd love to find out more about. Yes, it's just interesting, the sort of cross-cultural mm. um, communication or cross-cultural contamination, however we wish to describe it, that might have been going on. But, but thank you very much for your, your presentation. And um, John, you, you, you explained very, very clearly how, how influential the serifless letters of John Sohn were and you you talked about its percolation through um Flaxman and and through through Caslon. Um, um how far can you see the, this entering popular culture you know it's on 
it, it's used on monuments, but uh, um, it, 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 is there any sort of other ways of dissemination um, that you can see taking place through uh, Soane's lettering? Um, it, it's a lot more um, prevalent through the 18th century than perhaps we, we ever realised. I mean, f from the late 17th century, they start cutting serifless postage uh, uh, state stamps, um, which um, carry on to, to the third quarter of the um, 18th century. So they are public facing um, within, within ink stamps uh, in, in the postal system. Um, but academically, they're really used to represent the antique. So they are used in book printing when there is an inscription uh, that was uh, serifless or early, early Roman uh, without serifs uh, when they need to um, when they need to print that um, and it's not really until the, uh, the 19th century that they start to be used widely in print. Um, they are they are seen inscribed on uh, on um, on, on sort of scarabs and, and artifacts from the Grand Tour. So within that circle, you know, they're, they're, quite, they're quite prevalent and quite well known as representing the antique world. Thank, thank you very much indeed. That's a, a very sort of full answer. Um, right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to um, end the proceedings or, or pass the proceedings over to the University of Wolverhampton. But first I would like to thank all the presenters for their varied, wide-ranging and stimulating talks. Um, I learned a lot. Obviously, I'd, I'd, I'd read all the chapters in the book, but often hearing the pr presenters um, selecting what they consider to be the most important elements and, and adding illustrations more than we could have in the book were were, were, were very valuable and, and, and very important. And I, I hope those of you who are with us will be able to look at the book, um, perhaps buy it for their libraries or get it themselves as a Christmas present. Mm -hmm. And um, um, that's, uh, that, that's wonderful. There's uh, a, a lot of, uh, there's a number of uh, comments coming through uh, just thanking the presentations um, from Susan Mentis and Karen Danell, for, for example. Um, so let us uh, terminate the proceedings. Let me hand things over to the University of Wolverhampton. So thank you very much indeed, everyone. And I'm sure we can clap in silence uh, uh, to, uh, to, to thank the, the presenters. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, thank you to all of our speakers this thank evening, you. and of course to Malcolm for hosting. Um, our next ArtsFest online event will be on Wednesday, the 25th of November, and is part of UK Disability Month. We Are Invisible, We Are Visible is a talk that will take us through 50 years of disability activism and disability art. This event can be booked through Eventbrite um, and it's free. So please go and book, uh, book on straight away. Uh, thanks for watching this evening and we'll see you all soon. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Claire. Claire. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.